Pete's Dragon is a 1977 live action animated musical fantasy comedy produced by Walt Disney Productions and distributed by Buena Vista. This movie is the second in my new series of classic Disney movies. So come with me now as I tell you the story of Pete's Dragon. Set in the early 1900s and over a period of six days, Pete's Dragon features Elliot, a magical and sometimes mischievous dragon that causes chaos and mayhem in a small main fishing village when he tries to help a young orphan boy called Pete escape from his evil foster parents. Pete wants to live in a lighthouse with Nora and her father. Will Elliot be able to help him achieve his dream? while avoiding the clutches of the greedy Dr. Tyramus, who wants to exploit him. Pete's Dragon started life in 1957 with the Walt Disney Studios. The project was originally going to be a two-part special for the Disneyland television series, but the project was shelved. Finally, after sitting in the Disney vaults for nearly 20 years, Philemon began on Pete's Dragon in the summer of 1976, with the movie premiering a little over 18 months later on November the 3rd, 1977 at the Radio City Music Hall in New York. The movie has had a troubled history as far as the many different versions released over the years. It originally ran at 134 minutes. After its premiere in Hollywood, it was cut down to 121 minutes before its premiere in New York. When it was released in Europe, it ran at 105 minutes, with musical numbers cut as well as 21 scenes shortened. This version was used for the original home video release in 1980, but every video release since then has run at 128 minutes restoring the songs and a majority of the dramatic material. However, when Disney re-released it in theatres, it was the European cut that was used once again. Even further cuts were made to the TV version of the movie when it premiered on the Disney Sunday movie in 1986. The movie was also the first movie to be released by Disney on VHS on their very own label under Walt Disney Home Video. The movie was directed by British movie director, writer, producer and art director Don Chaffee. Produced by Jerome Cortland and Ron W. Miller. With screenplay by Malcolm Marmerstein. Based on the stories by Seton I. Miller and S.S. Field. The movie starred Sean Marshall as Pete who had beat hundreds of kids for the audition to play Pete. Helen Reddy as Nora in her first leading role in a movie. British comedian Jim Dale as Dr. Tyramus. The legendary Mickey Rooney as Lampy. Red Button as Hoagie. Shelley Winters as Lena Guggen. And veteran actor Charlie Callis known for his rubbery face long before Jim Carrey as the voice of Elliot the Dragon. Also on hand to direct the animated parts of Pete's Dragon was legendary Disney animator Don Bluth. Don Chafee offered and insisted to share the directing credits with Don Bluth, but Disney would not allow this since most of the movie is in live action. The movie was notorious for clocking up hours and hours of overtime for the animators. So much so, Don Bluth left the Disney organization a couple of years later in 1979, 
with a fellow nine other Disney animators to start his own animation studio, Don Bluth Productions. He went on to animate and direct The Secrets of Nymph, An American Tale, The Land Before Time, All Dogs Go to Heaven, among others. Don Hahn, who was the assistant director to Don Bluth on the movie, gained some experience work with a combination of live action and animation before later going on to work on Who Framed Roger Rabbit in 1988. Also, this was the first Disney movie involving animation in which none of the nine old men of Disney's original animation team was involved. Originally, Elliot the Dragon was not seen in the movie and remained invisible throughout. However, members from the studio animation department gradually lobbied studio heads to increase the amount of visible screen time he had. At first, it was decided he would only be seen at the end of the movie, but ultimately the character's screen time was increased to 22 minutes. Also, the animators of the movie opted to make Elliot look more like an oriental dragon rather than an occidental dragon because oriental dragons are usually associated with good. The movie was a moderate success, grossing $18 million at the box office, with just over a $10 million budget. However, it was a severe disappointment for Disney, who were hoping to repeat the success of Mary Poppins, as well as suffering as it was released at the same time as Star Wars. The movie may look like it took place in Maine, but neither the cast nor the crew went anywhere near the Pine Tree State. The landscape scenes were courtesy of Disney's Golden Oak Ranch in California, while the Passamaquoddy Town Square and Wharf areas were constructed on Disney's Burbank studio lot, partly from an old western set. Even the harbour was constructed on set. Noran Lampy's lighthouse was equipped with a real lighthouse lens and a wick stand that could create a beacon that was visible for 18 to 24 miles. Constructed on California's Morro Bay, Disney had to obtain permission from the US Coast Guard to actually light the lamp. There were plans eventually to move the lighthouse to Disneyland, but it became too beyond repair for this to be done. Originally, Al Kasher and Joel Hirschhorn were only hired to write one song, Candle on the Water. But the studio was so pleased with that song, they decided to make the movie a musical and kept them on to write the score. Unlike most Disney movies, the original soundtrack was released by Capitol Records because Helen Reddy was signed to them at the time. She recorded a single version of Candle on the Water with a different arrangement that was released as a single. And both it and the movie version of the song was on the album. The single did not make the pop charts but reached number 27 on the Billboard Adult Contemporary chart. Walt Disney Records acquired the rights to reissue the CD in 2002, but only the movie version was kept on this release. Candle on the Water was also nominated for the best song at the Oscars, but it lost out to You Light Up My Life. An earlier version of the song, Brazzle Dazzle Day, depicted Nora showing Pete how to clean the lamp in the lighthouse, but it was totally rewritten except for the name of the song. The only part of the original song that survives in the movie is Lampy's line, when your job becomes a frolic, you become a brassaholic. Disney considered a living Newton John for the role of Nora at one point, but she was not available. Helen Reddy took the role because it was the best script she had been offered since her role playing a singing nun in Airport 75, and because she felt it was more appropriate for her and her yet unborn grandchildren to watch. After this movie, she mostly gave up acting though. This is the second time Red Buttons and Shelley Winters had worked together. 
The first time was on the Poseidon Adventure in 1972. They also made guest appearances on Roseanne in 1988. Dawn Wells from Gilligan's Island almost got the role of Nora, but dropped out the movie at the last minute. If she had taken this role, it would have been her first movie outside of Gilligan's Island with Jim Backus, who had an extended cameo as the mayor. Joel Grey was also the original choice for Dr. Tiramis before Jim Dale. Some of the original design concepts for Elliot depict him having six legs and not walking upright. An early draft of the script had a character named Ferdinand, a showman who wanted to exploit Elliot and take him on tour. He even had a song called The Greatest Star of All, which was cut when the character was dropped from the movie. Did you notice the homage to Goofy in the movie? When Dr. Tiramis is tied to the harpoon and shot through the cannon and flies through the building, you hear a goofy holler. The scene where Mickey Rooney and Red Buttons drunkenly walk into the cave to see Elliot turned into a massive ablib session, with each comedian trying to outdo the other with pratfalls and slapstick. The director said, that was fantastic, but we can't have a 20 minute scene when there are just two of you walking through the cave. We've got to do a reshoot, Marshall recalled. The Gogans, the secondary villains of the movie, had both the first and the last musical number of the movie. It's not often that the villains in a Disney movie gets more than one musical sequence, let alone the first and the last one. I hope you've enjoyed this look at Pete's Dragon. If you like this video, don't forget to check out the rest of my channel for more Disney movie content. And to get notifications when I next upload a video, don't forget to subscribe. Until next time, I'm Disney Dave and thanks for watching.